This podcast is brought to you by Reynolds & Reynolds, the industry leader in automotive technology. Learn how inadequate data may be impacting your used vehicle department at reyrey.com slash used cars. That's R-E-Y, R-E-Y dot com slash used dash cars. Want to dive deeper into the topics you hear about on Daily Drive? We're offering listeners a special offer, 20% off a one-year automotive news digital subscription. That gets you access to all of our news, information, and analysis made for automotive industry leaders like you. Go to autonews.com slash daily drive promo to redeem. Welcome to Daily Drive for Wednesday, December 27th, 2023. I'm Jamie Butters, Executive Editor of Automotive News in Detroit. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today on the show, did electric vehicles have a good or bad year in 2023? It depends on who you ask. EV sales are not declining. That's the narrative we're kind of seeing outside of the industry. They aren't declining, but the pace of growth definitely has slowed. As part of our special series of year-end conversations, Automotive News electrification reporter Hannah Lutz talks with Jamie about all things EV in 2023 and what to expect in 2024 as the market moves closer to an electrified future. Hannah Lutz, welcome back to Daily Drive. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for having me. So this is part of our year in review conversation series. And of course, uh, you're on the electrification beat. So we're here to talk about EVs. Uh, the EV market has taken kind of a beating in the public opinion, it seems like, at least within the industry and sort of leaking out into the to the rest of society. Uh, what What do you see going on in the market? Well, I want to be clear that EV sales are not declining. That's the narrative we're kind of seeing outside of the industry. They aren't declining, but the pace of growth definitely has slowed for a number of reasons. I mean, it's not an easy transition to make for a consumer. Mm -hmm. Well, we saw, you know, EV market share has stayed pretty steady in sort of the 7 to 8% range this year. And to not, I guess the fact that it's not gone up month after month, uh, has been discouraging to some, but it still compares to, you know, 5%, 5.5% market share last year. So it's really pretty significant growth, but maybe a, but a little more challenge. There's a, a lot more supply. Some dealers are certainly sitting with EVs on their lots in a way that they just didn't face at all in 2022 and previous years. Yeah, it's not the exponential growth that we had seen pre in previous months and years. And dealers are they do have a lot of EVs sitting on their lots. The automakers kind of rushed to build them because um, just last year and the year before, there were wait lists for EVs and, and reservations and people really wanted them and they really couldn't get them fast enough. Now there's sort of, there's an oversupply in some cases mm -hmm. that leaves dealers with full lots of, of EVs and discounts even. Like you wouldn't imagine an EV discount unless it was on a leaf or something, something that had been around for a while or a bolt. You wouldn't imagine a discount on a new EV a few years ago, but that's what we are seeing now. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Tesla's price cuts have put a lot of pressure on, especially those other compact crossovers that compete with the Model Y. Yes, that's for sure. Tesla is definitely moving the market in terms of price, some deep cuts on on its models that are lowering the the average transaction price for, for an EV as well, getting it closer to um, an internal combustion vehicle, but still most consumers are still priced out of the EV market. Yeah, we're, I feel like part of the problem with EV demand and EV sales is the price and really the mix of products. You know, we saw part of that exponential growth was when we went from $100,000 sedans and $100,000 pickups into more of the $50,000 compact electric crossovers. But we're not really getting those new models now like we were last year and the year before. No, there's a lot of talk about them, but we aren't quite <laughs> seeing them yet. So that's that's probably, you know, a big driver of this conversation that you know, EVs aren't going to make it or something. A lot of the talk around that is because we aren't seeing EVs for everyone yet, which is the ultimate goal of of many of the automakers. There are some interesting products coming. We're starting to see some three-row EVs uh, from Volvo and, and Kia. And then hopefully we get some of those more affordable EVs from GM. They've been talking about the Equinox EV, the, the next-gen Bolt. Those could really 
help crack into the mass market a bit better. Right. We've kind of addressed those early adopters and some of the luxury buyers, but we'll see what the true demand is when we have those affordable options um, come to market, which will be in 2024 and even in a bigger way in 2025. You know, it's it's a little puzzling because we see prices on EVs are maybe on average about 10% higher, four to $5,000 more than the overall market. And we have these federal subsidies, federal tax credits of up to $7,500. Seems like that should make up for it or more than make up for it. But it, it hasn't quite, at least not in the psyche of the American consumer. No, the tax credits, the EV tax credits are confusing. That's mm-hmm. the first thing. They're very, very confusing mm-hmm. for me as a reporter and <laughs> for consumers. This year, they haven't been given at the point of sale. Next year, they will be point of sale. But there are other questions that have popped up around which vehicles are eligible. So it's a nice benefit to get that EV tax credit. But for the average consumer, it it probably needs to be a, a clearer benefit. Yeah, it's tricky because if it applies to, to your taxes for the following year, that's a long time to wait. Um, we'll see, you know, point of sale should help, but of course, a lot fewer vehicles we believe are going to be eligible next year when the foreign entity of concern rules kick in. Uh, so maybe less help there, although the EV lease support continues, but automakers are a little reluctant to get too heavy into leases, it seems. Yeah, it's complicated because we don't, the industry doesn't know the resale value yet. I was talking with a dealer earlier today saying who's saying that was a big concern and that's why leasing is such a, a big product for, for EVs because it gives the consumer that reassurance. You, it's not your problem how mm-hmm. much the vehicle is, is worth at the end of um, your time with it. In the short term, it seems like, you know, the companies like brands like Kia or Hyundai uh, that aren't making a lot of EVs in the U.S. uh, should just go all lease. But of course, it's very risky uh, when you don't know what the resale value is going to be in three years. And we're seeing a lot of pricing pressure on used EVs right now, in part because of Tesla and their price cuts. Yeah. And I mean, it's we won't see that in a significant volume for a few years. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But for now, that is a consideration among among buyers. Coming up, Hannah and Jamie continue their year-end conversation about EVs and a look at how much progress has been made on the charging front. That's next on Daily Drive. The auto industry's shift to carbon neutrality is here and it's accelerating. But is it enough? This is a moral imperative, an economic imperative, a moment of peril, but also a moment of extraordinary possibilities. No more hesitancy, no more excuses, no more waiting for the others to move first. There is simply no more time for that. Driving to Zero is a new podcast series from Automotive News that looks at the auto industry's roadmap to carbon neutrality. We take a big picture look at the environmental, political, and social trends pushing the move toward a greener future. And we pull back the curtain on how these decisions are being made at the highest levels. I said, you know, the the headline that you need is is GM believes in an all-electric future. And I think Dan Ammon and Mary Barra pretty much said the same thing, which is is like, but but we, we don't. Spoiler alert, they came around to that idea. Find out how and much more. I'm Jake Neer. Join me and Automotive News Executive Editor Jamie Butters on Driving to Zero, available now wherever you get your podcasts. Lack of inventory, increased auction fees, and a volatile market means stocking your lot can be challenging these days. To be successful, you have to move fast. You need to make decisions quickly at auction. You need to inspect trade-ins and decide on an offer that will benefit you without slowing down the sales process. You need to appraise and price vehicles with the most up-to-date information possible in a market that can change quickly. But the data you rely on to make these decisions could be holding you back. How often do you find yourself manually filtering through comps because there are outliers that don't match the vehicle you're appraising? When unexpected mechanical issues come up, How much time do you have to spend looking back through comps to reprice the vehicle and determine if the reconditioning costs are worth it? How long do you spend searching through individual auction and third-party websites for the inventory you need? These problems affect the entire used vehicle process 
from acquisition to appraisal to merchandising. Visit reyrey.com slash used cars to explore how old and irrelevant vehicle information may be holding you back and discover how to make improvements for faster, more accurate, and more profitable decisions. That's R-E-Y, slash used dash cars. Welcome back to Daily Drive. I'm Jamie Butters with Kellen Walker. I'm talking with Automotive News electrification reporter Hannah Lutz about the year that electric vehicles had in 2023. We've been talking about consumer demand, and now we'll look at one of the biggest ongoing pain points for EV adoption, charging. The other big challenge for EV adoption has been charging, right? We used to call it range anxiety. Now we focus more on charger anxiety. Uh, Not everyone can put a charger in their home. And, you know, you wrote last year, this is early in the year, you wrote about how, you know, 20% or a, a large percentage of chargers Uh, don't work when people need them, public chargers. Has that gotten any better over the course of 2023? Um, It stayed in that general area of like one in five charging attempts failed through Mm. most of the year. So I would say, though, it probably is getting better because of the awareness around it and the charging companies, the big ones like EVgo and ChargePoint and Electrify America, they have initiatives towards improving the experience and improving reliability of chargers. Also, the NEVI funds have been distributed to the states, and those are starting to be implemented. The I think the first charger came online in December mm-hmm. in Ohio. So that's all good good progress. Uh, the joint office told me that they had installed 1,000 charge ports a week since June. Okay. So that's progress. It's not 500,000 like the goal is for 2030, but, you know, steps in the right direction. Yeah. And then the other big step that should make charging the charging experience better for consumers, they're going to have to wait for. And that's the adoption of Tesla's North American charging standard, which most automakers, at least a lot of brands, have now announced uh, that they're going to collaborate with Tesla and start offering basically Tesla's system on their cars starting sometime in 25. Right. So for now, you could use an adapter without the port. But yes, in 2025, many non-Tesla EVs will be built with the Tesla standard charging port. So that will that will open up the charging market in a big way. Tesla has, you know, for the one in five charge attempts that failed, I mean, Tesla is basically not part of that. Tesla has very reliable charging infrastructure. I think it remains to be seen how compatible it is with the other makes. They're working on that, so hopefully it won't be an issue, but it it really will open up charging for sure for for all consumers. It's it's another one of those examples of how Tesla is just so far ahead, right? They spent all those years losing money, uh, (laughs) but, uh, but building out their charging network, their product portfolio, their mineral acquisition strategies, you know, battery recycling. I mean, they've just really addressed a lot of those pain points before other automakers were really even in the game. Yeah, they jumped into EVs fully. I mean, Mm -hmm. as a new automaker that is only making EVs, they had to figure out the whole ecosystem from the batteries to charging and beyond, and they really have mastered it. So they can do everything in-house, and that gives them a great advantage with everyone else as a competitor and as a partner, as we're seeing now with opening the the charging network. So before we get to 2025, we have to live through 2024 first. What do you anticipate as some of the big stories coming into next year? I think it might be more of the same, more of what we've seen towards the end of 2023, where the pace of growth is just not quite as robust as it has been over the past couple of years. Because it's growing pains. I mean, people might be waiting out the Tesla charge ports in, in non-Tesla vehicles. They might be waiting to see what happens with the, the tax credit. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of reasons kind of to wait and see. So that might that might be happening. But um, in terms of charging infrastructure, that will only continue to expand. You know, like I said, we just saw the, the first NEVI-funded charger going online. It's the first of 
many of, of hundreds of thousands, hopefully likely. So we'll see more and more of that. We'll probably see more involvement in charging from the convenience store chains. They're already in it, but expanded role. Same with gas stations. And it'll be interesting to watch what the startup charging companies do because they have struggled to, to make a profit. Yeah, it's a it's a reminder of the long lead times that we always have in this industry. And we're used to it in some ways on the product side. You know, you know, the company's working on a product for a certain segment. Maybe you then see it at an auto show or you see a concept and then it takes another year to get the production version and another year to get it or half a year to get get the factories up and running. And here we've got, you know, all these. You know, it takes a long time to build you know the charging network. But I mean, especially painful is the the mining, creating battery materials here in North America that don't have to come from China. It's a lot of things, a lot of problems that are solvable, but they take time. Yeah, a lot of moving pieces, like you said, that that need to be solved for. And on the consumer side, I've seen many surveys that say EV consideration is high, like above fifty percent. It's it's mm-hmm. high, so. It seems from conversations with dealers, what stops them, what stops the consumers is at point of sale when they ask the questions like what their daily life would be when they own an EV and it it can be complicated with charging or with the battery in in a cold climate. There are some other challenges to be solved as well. A lot of a lot of issues to solve, but uh, we'll. Be counting on you to help us keep track of the work that goes on for them in 2024 and beyond. Hannah Lutz, thank you so much for being here with us today on Daily Drive. Thank you. That's Daily Drive for today. I'm Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to Automotive News coordinating producer Jake Neer for his help on today's podcast. You can get the latest news on electric vehicles, charging, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. Today, we talked all about EVs. Come back tomorrow for a look at AVs and the tumultuous year the self-driving industry had in 2023. We're looking at this like in the focus of a year. We rode a roller coaster up at the beginning of the year (laughs) and we're riding it down right now. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review and subscribe so you never miss an episode. 